Hey guys, it's Ian Bick. We are back with another episode of Locked In. Today I'm interviewing Melvin Acevedo, who spent six years in prison. In this episode, we detail his early childhood. We go through the acts of why he got sentenced to prison time, and then also how he was able to turn it all around and become a rapper who goes by the name Alpha Mel. Hope you guys sit back, relax, and enjoy this episode of Locked In. Appreciate all the love and support you guys have been showing us. It's really taking off and it doesn't go unnoticed. If you guys could also take one quick second to please, 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 please go to Spotify or Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts from, just leave us a review. It could be a review if you don't like us. It could be a great review if you do appreciate us. It helps us get the podcast out, improve our show, and get known on the platforms. Thank you guys again. Sit back, relax, and enjoy my interview with Melvin Acevedo. Melvin, welcome to the show, man. You came out today from New Jersey all, all the way to come see us. So what's up, man? Thanks for having me, man. Yeah, how you doing Long today? Ride, but I'm here. <laughs> awesome, man. Yeah. I'm glad to hear it. Uh, let's jump right into your story. Let's do it. Where are you from? Where'd you grow up? What's your childhood like? Uh, Puerto Rican, uh, from the Bronx, born and raised. Um, Came from Jersey because I picked up my beautiful manager. I mean, she lived out there, so I had to pick up. She wouldn't let me come without her. <laughs> so you're the driver. Yeah, but she said, you're going to drive, but come get me. And <laughs> she's then. the manager, but you're the driver. Yeah, okay. I'm the driver for sure. And she, she be, she's my uh, schedule. You know what I mean, shout out to her. A lot of love. She holds me down. So yeah, from the Bronx, um, Puerto Rican, you know. Uh, grew up with my, my mother. My father was in prison as well, you know, most of my life. Uh, brother and a sister a cousin that i consider my sister as well and you know story goes from there what you want to know are yeah. you the youngest oldest middle child i'm the youngest youngest yeah wow we all have the same mother and father and i'm the youngest of uh, a brother and a sister my brother passed away um he got me by five years my sister has me by three years i'm sorry to hear that man yeah you know regular life thank you though Oh, I mean, it's not regular, but it it, it happens, you yeah. know, but it's not. That's how I brush it off, you know? Like, it happens to everybody is what I mean, you know? I can't feel like I'm special. Yeah, you know? I get it. And yeah. growing up in the Bronx, is it, like, a bad area? Is it the good part? What, yeah, what, I, what I would you describe in, it? I, it it's, uh, I would say if you're not from there, my area, you would think uh, bad of it. But if you're from there, you know, it's pretty warm. But um, there's a lot of temp out there. You know, people got... There's a lot of bipolar going on out there, you know, and a good day could turn bad fast. But if you grow up out there, you know, uh, it's pretty good. You know, I'm in the hybrid section, Morris Heights, um, Cedric Projects, right up the block from where hip hop was born, actually. Mm -hmm. And yeah, there's there's violence out there, shootings. I grew up around shootings, seeing, you know, dead bodies and stuff. And that was just normal to you? Yeah, yeah, it was normal. Um, I wouldn't say on an everyday thing, but more than I would like to see it, you know? And you weren't scared at all, like as a kid walking around through the Bronx? Yeah, one one time I ran right into one going outside, like it was on the stairs and it made me, I was like, I don't really remember the, the age, but I was probably like nine, eight, um, going outside to play. And, you know, we run into the stairs when you're kids, like you think the building on fire the way you run outside to play and that's how I opened the door to the stairs. And there was a body right there, shit caught me off guard, took my win, I cried. I oh, mean, then my boy came and he was regular, my best friend. He was like, what happened? Where's that? And I showed him where it was at. And he's like, he tapping it. Yo, you dead? Like, like you know, that's how it is where I'm at. You know, but it, it scared normal, the shit out of me. Yeah, it scared. that was my first uh, encounter with one of those, you know what I mean? And it scared the shit out of me. You think it was like traumatic for you seeing that and being in that area? Yeah, because I never ran into them steps like that again. I didn't take the other side because you got the A sign, the B sign, the projects. My shit, was, I believe I was on the B side, um, if I could remember. Um, and yeah, I never ran into the stairs anymore. I like looked through the glass and then opened the steps. Now at that age, is it normal to like be walking around on your own because it's a city? Like, is your mom taking you to school? How does that all work? Um, shout out to Mama Love, right? I lost her in 2020, not to COVID, to a son, totally different, right? Um, I would say, you know, my mother taught me principles and manners, but she wasn't really raised to take kids to the movie. You know, she wasn't really took, taken out or showed how to get a job and shit. So she showed me anything. Before I say anything, I want to say that. She showed me everything she could other than what she was taught 
to, to and I, it's my job to pass it down to my kids on a positive note, just like she did. She only taught me what she was taught. Well, not what she was taught, what the little bit good that she had in her life, she gave it to me. That's what I'm trying to say, you know what I mean? So, um, yeah, I went to school alone. Um, when I was, it started like when I was like in third grade, I started going to school alone. And yeah, on the, on the walks of school, was, you know, there's stuff going on. It was a long walk. But not, nothing traumatic, I would say, because it's a regular thing. It's a regular day. Like, even the day I saw the dead body, like, I still went outside and played. Like, nothing happened. I got over it. Still went outside and played. You know what I mean? Talked about it with my friends like it was cool. Yeah. That's the problem. And that it's was just cool. Um, yeah, that was, it was another regular day for you guys. Mm -hmm. Now, so, what was it like to have your father in prison growing up? It was whack because... Um, I was like poor, you know, I wasn't always fly. I was like the bummiest in the projects. Um, my mother fed me all the time, but she didn't have enough to keep me, you know, looking nice. So I was fighting a lot for people trying to snap on me. Like people thinking they could bully me just cause you know, the way I looked. And you know, looking how I look as well. Like I look like a white boy in the, in the middle of the projects, nothing but black people, Spanish people, even though I'm Spanish. So going, leaving my hood, it was a challenge because they're like, who this white boy when they don't know, you know, I'm from here. Like, this is my culture. So that was hard as well. Um, but yeah, man. Did you have any relationship with your father while he was in prison? Uh, my father, back to that, I kind of steered off. Um, yeah, he was, uh, I remember one memory when he was home. I saw him laying, sleeping at that. He was sleeping and I poked the son that we call Farina. I don't know if you heard about it. It's like mm -hmm. oatmeal, you could say. It's like a, a starch thing, you make, it's, it's real good. Um, I'm poking holes in it. I remember that while he's sleeping, cause it gets so cold that when you poke holes, it leaves a hole. So as a kid, I just wanted to leave the holes in that shit. So yeah. then everything, every other memory is me visiting him, going to trailer visits. So it was hard cause a lot of people, not too many, but the people that had them, you know, they, they look happy. They doing things with their father. I'm like lying that my father's coming home soon knowing he ain't. How, how much so, time did he get and what did he go to prison for? Um, he went to prison. I know, like the main one was like a ten murder, something like that. And it was to defend, it was to defend a family member, um, my his sister's kids. And he went away. I really don't remember too much of him when I was a kid. He did like eleven. Then he came home when I was like, like fourteen, fifteen. I saw him like once or twice, and then I went away. I went to jail, and then he went to jail again for another eleven. Oh, so wow. he was like always in there. Yeah. And what year is this? Like what time frame? Um, when I went to jail? Well, no, when you're growing up and um, he's in prison. This is this is all the way to to like 14, 15 years old. He was in prison. Well, like what year is this? Like oh, early, this is you know? um this is uh the nineties, the late nineties. Late nineties. Yeah. So, and how old are you now? I'm thirty six. Thirty six now. Yeah. How did you got about eight years on me. <laughs> yeah. Over. Right. Yeah. So, were you like bullied for not having your dad around or? Nah. Did you feel like excluded though because he wasn't around? Mm, not really. Like, yeah, no, like, you know, not too many people had their dads, but they had moms that, you know, they worked hard. They, you know, and they, there was, uh, my mother was always an immigrant, so she had to take those jobs that didn't pay too much. I'm Puerto Rican, but my mother's Costa Rican. I just grew up Puerto Rican, you know, but my mother didn't have her papers all her life out here. So she had to take the jobs that was giving her two, three hundred dollars a week. What kind of work was she doing? She was working in like um Spanish restaurants like the Gucci Fritos, bakeries, Kennedy fried chicken, things like that. You know? Did that did her work ethic get instilled in you too at a young age? I saw I saw the grind that, you know, I never saw her and she always came back so tired with so little. And it made me, you know, just wanna go get shit on my own. Now, let's get into going on your own and stuff. What's high school um, like? Do you start hustling in high school? What, where's well, the path? I wasn't really a hustler. I was more, you know, I did sell my little weed, but that was very short lived because my brother found out, took it from me, and, you know. That's a good brother. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, he always tried to keep me away because he, I always, you know, he always pushed me away, but I knew and heard of him through everybody in my block. Like, and they didn't even know that was my brother because I never ran around like, oh, Hector's my brother because he was one of the wildest dudes in the block. Rest in peace to him. So, um, you know, I'm kind of getting sidetracked, but yeah, like him out there, you know, he was always one of the wildest ones and I never used him as a getaway. So what was the question again? Cause I could touch Just what on. high school is like and, so, and what you're getting into. High school, um, high school actually, you know, all the way to high school, I was like into bad shit. High school, I was still into bad shit, but I started focusing more on the girls. 
but that was short lived because I went to, I had like a year in high school and then I went to jail. In high school, you went to jail. Yeah, so, I went to jail like in tenth grade or something. Like tenth grade. Yeah. What did you do to go to jail in tenth grade? I shot somebody. You shot someone. Yeah. So let's somebody. let's let's talk about that. What exactly happened? What went down? Uh, what happened with that was you know. It goes back to being, you know, in the hood. Like, you know, the bully part was real, really, really short lived. Like, that was like second grade. Somebody thought they can bully me. I ended that immediately. Um, mm. Cause you know, I'm not a bully myself. Like, I'm gonna give you the chance. You think I'm soft, whatever. But once I'm fed up, it's over. So that's what happened. I did that. Um, damn, my fault. I'm getting sidetracked. Cause I had a something crazy happen to me today, man. Um, that I really don't want to touch on. But it's ironic that. I'm coming here because what almost happened could have sent me back to where what we're talking about right now, mm -hmm. you know. And it kind of got has me sidetracked because the pride that we have from you know holding all this anger and like you just want to wild out sometimes, but you can't because someone like me, I got two felonies. You know what I mean? So if I wild out, if I bug out on somebody, I go away. My kids have never seen me. The, the judge told me that. So when I go through shit like like what I went through today, that's rare. It like throws me off and I'm a little thrown off. That's why I'm like, I'm forgetting about your questions and shit. Yeah, I'm still, no, we'll take it one question at a time. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I go through that too. When there's, you have to be very careful of like who you're surrounding your time with, yeah. who you're giving your time to and, and not letting it affect your peace because we have more to lose than the average person because right. we already have strikes against us. So it's so important to, you know, just remember the eye on the prize and, and focus on everything you have going Yeah. and not ruin it. Cause things yeah. could change in a moment. Imagine you're out at a bar, you're having a great time with your friends, you're drinking, and then you hop in the car and, and that one second you're driving, you kill someone, you get in an accident and it's the rest of your life gone Out of here. just in that one moment. Or you pick a fight with someone over something stupid. You, you always have to think about those things yeah. because all the people that you know we talk to on here or go through really shit it, it comes down to one significant moment that yep. alters their life forever mm -hmm. so you always want to stay on course and just think about those things and, and just be cautious in that because you have so much you know you have your music career you have yeah. you have your your children you have everything and think about how far you came and think about what's ahead you know doing the podcast doing your music career anything like that you yeah. focus on those and that can bring you to like unobtainable levels that the average person can't get to because you have all that trauma in the past as like a fuel to your fire. Yeah, exactly. Now, I mean, so the day of the shooting, what, what goes down? Oh, so that, that happened cause um, you know, like they kind of used me, you know, my brother went to jail. Um, he told the wrong people to hold me down, make sure I wasn't out there wild and like he was trying to control me. And um, instead of holding me down, they kind of like used me to rob people and shit cause they knew I was with it. Um, my boy needed some bills paid or whatever. I'm helping him out. Um, everything went wrong. It went very wrong. Um, I heard gunshots go off. I thought my boy got hit. So it was like kind of a saving my boy type of situation. But at the end of the day, I regret it because the dude that I that I hit up, I kind I didn't know him. I just knew of him. You know what I mean? Um, never was his friend at all. You know, it goes like that. And but I just regret it because you know, as an adult now, I'll be like, damn. What if he had kids? What if I took him out? Cause I hit him where, you know, he could have died, you know? So what if I took him out? I took a father out, a brother out, a son out. It's deep like that for me now. But when you in the hood, it ain't deep like that. It's You're trying about, to survive. Yeah. It, yo, but let me touch deep on that. It's not even trying to survive. Like we're surviving every day. It's about people are trying to impress you. Like you think killing someone is cool. You think going to jail is cool, it's a badge. These little kids out there, they think it's a badge. And that's why I'm here now, because it's not. You go in there, you want to go in your bathroom for 30 years, go kill somebody, you know? Like, it's not a badge of honor. I was looking at it like a badge of honor. I was having conversations with my people. It's like, yo, if we go to jail, we're going to hold it down. You know, like, that shit is very ignorant. You know, and so it's, it's like, yeah, surviving, but then it becomes a, a matter of, let me just impress who I can impress and let them know I'm the realest motherfucker in this crazy block. That's what it is. Why do you think you had that mentality? Where did it come from at that age? Because you're, what, 14, 15 years old when this goes yeah. down? So where does that come from at that age? I feel like it came from just an everyday thing, you know? Like hearing gunshots go off and your whole entire family jumping on the floor because a bullet could go into your window from the third floor in the projects. Um, running into the building because the black party got shot up. And then going back outside when it's clears, 
Like, it, it's just natural. It comes from that. Like, it's what you're seeing, you know? Like, if you get thrown in a basketball camp and you get, you lock, they lock the key up and you're there for two years, you're going to come out that shit balling, <laughs> you know? So if you're thrown in the projects and all you see around you is people selling drugs, using drugs, fighting to join gangs, um, fighting just because a basketball game went wrong, like, it's just, this is way of life. It just creates a, this little animal in you. Do you think if you had lived somewhere else it would have your your life would have ended definitely, up differently definitely like I, I look at life from a different perspective now right because i look at for example like i got a nephew on the right side um i know this is my left i mean like on the right side of life <laughs> i said right side i got a, a a nephew on the right side of life right and then i got a nephew he's not on the wrong side but he's on the wrong side of uh, the area my nephew that's on the right side he's in a good area right he grew up very nice, like very polite kid. And then I put him next to my nephew from this side of the Bronx. And they're both sweet kids, but this one, he's a little, you can see the crazy in him. This one, he's so oblivious. I'll send him to the store. Yo, get me a uh, juice real quick. I won't send him because he won't know how to walk through there. And it's not his fault. It's just he wasn't raised where this one was. So it's all about where you at. It literally is. Like I got my kids out the hood now and it's beautiful. I leave my front door unlocked. You know what I mean, I would never leave even leave my windows unlocked in the projects. Mm. Third floor, patio, um, little balcony shit on top of the entrance. Like I always thought crazy like that. It's amazing how where we come from can affect our lives so much. I mean, like if I, I literally lived an hour away from you and my life was so much different, I can only imagine if my life was your life and I lived in that area, if that was would have been my destiny. Where where you grew up at, if your mommy asked? In Danbury, Connecticut. Oh, I right, so you're in CC. Yeah, and sometimes that's out of our control, like where we're born mm-hmm. and where we you're live. You're just thrown in yeah, yeah, I was born in Manhattan, um, mm-hmm. but my family moved us out to Connecticut, and we grew up in my dad's summer house that they renovated. Yeah. And it's just, it's crazy, that's you know? That's beautiful, though. Yeah, but you didn't choose that, you yeah, know? Yeah, like the universe you. did, but yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the universe, yeah, and your parents, you know, your parents knew they didn't want nothing. You know, they in Manhattan, you know Manhattan, you walk a block up. You could be in the nice area. You walk a block up, you're probably in the hood. Yeah. So they didn't want that. They moved you out, and that's beautiful, bro. Yeah. Now, going back to the shooting, how do you get a gun at that age? Like, how does that happen? Because where I come Man. from, we didn't just have a gun at, at 14 years old, you know? Yeah. Or even know how to get one. Yo, I'm very, I'm like an open book, but I'm, you know, I'm going to just give y'all it all. Like, you know, like, guns. I done seen pictures of my father holding guns, like, thinking he cool, you know what I mean? I got pictures of myself as a kid holding guns. Like, Putting on the gram. <laughs> I probably threw it on the gram once, like, I wasn't always like this, you know, you know what I mean? Like, some stupid shit, but, um, yo, I, I got too many, like, it's, your question is crazy, because guns, it's never been hard to get. It's so easy. Like, my brother had a million. I used to play with my brother's guns while he's sleeping. I mean, oh, this is cool, shiny. My my sister dating boyfriends that were gun heavy, like, loving guns, like, under the mattress, guns. Like, I done, you know, one story, yo, Mel, come to the room. I'm coming to the room. Close your eyes, though. I walk in the room with my eyes closed. I open them. I open them, and they cocking a fucking 12-gauge in my face, and I'm fucking 12. And I'm like, whoa, can I hold it? And I'm like, it's just the fuck it is, like the movies. I mean, why do you think that these grown men thought it was okay to introduce he, kids to you it? Know, he a grown man, but at that time he was only like 22, 23, and you know that ain't grown. Like you're, you said you like what six years younger than me. I'm right? 28 now. Yeah. Yeah, you know what I mean. You're, we're, I'm still a kid, bro. I'm 36. I'm a grown ass man. I got, I get my shit done. But what I'm saying is, I'm still a kid, man. Like. 50 is you're still young at 50 so imagine a 20 year old he's a kid bro yeah. especially in the hood with no guidance no i still call myself a kid now too yeah we're still <laughs> we're still young man we still got a lot to grow so imagine a 20 year old in the hood where they ain't really teaching you too much i mean i had the dude that was trying to teach me shout out to him man i'm not even gonna say his name but the dude that was trying to teach me he was a fucking star in the hood he was ready to go to the i think the nfl he was a star seen him on tv all that um you know, he used to see me practicing because I used to play ball as a kid. He used to see me practicing my moves and shit. I was really nice in ball. I never had a jump shot, but I would break your ankles. I broke a few. Excuse me. Um, nice little layup. Um, so he used to see me from his window. So one day he came down and he's like busting my ass. Like, nigga, you want to play ball? He's busting my ass. So 
And he told me, yo, don't follow your brother's footsteps. Because, you know, everybody know about my brother. He was a little crazy and shit. So he like, don't follow your brother's footsteps. I see you out here. You know, try to, you know, do the right thing. He ended up shooting. He went to college, shot somebody in the face, went to jail. You know, like, it's like all your idols are like, who's who's an idol out here? You know, who who do we look up to? Yeah. You know, it's so, it's 20, 30 people can't look up to one person. They can't. Like, you had the people in the hood that come through, throw the block parties. You know, they're good people, but they can't take care of all of us. Were you running in, like, a, an official gang at this time, or is this just hanging out with your brother? Um, well, you know, me, my brother, and, you know, uh, like, two more people. We had our clique, um, and I ran with who I ran with. You know, I ran around a few people. Um, but it wasn't, like, an official, like, gang, like uh, like the Bloods or whatever whatever the gang was? I'm, I'm, I'm affiliated with uh, everyone. I mean, like... I know everyone, mm-hmm. you know, like I know all the Bloods, I know all the Crips, Kings, they all love me, I love them. I mean, I've been, I I ran around a few people, I just don't want to get into that because, you know, they be going crazy, sweeping people and shit, you know, bringing them, you know, I'm nothing like I was back then, so I wouldn't want something I say to make them think I'm still affiliated with a certain, with a certain clique and then, you know, I like Puerto Rico, not Rico. <laughs> And you you were just ex- <laughs> you were exposed to that just early on through your family through your brother, um, or did that just not, happen through school? Yeah, yeah. Um, it was my neighborhood. It's happening in school. You know, I'm I'm from the block where where the blood started at in the Bronx. I'm not from the block, but I'm up the block, and that's actually I don't even want to talk about what happened today. But <laughs> now, what were your aspirations as a kid? Like, did you have honestly any? to rap? I always wanted to rap. It's crazy I started so late, but I always wanted to rap. Um, I don't think I wanted to do anything else because I never, I knew I wouldn't be a basketball player, none of that. I I wasn't playing baseball. I did all that. I played ball, um, basketball, uh, baseball, football. I was nice and all of that, but school was never really my thing. Very smart, but I just didn't want to be there, you know? I would go past the test if I had a test, but I hated it, you know? I hated the thought of it. I just, I think I, I started rapping at nine. I'm just going hard now because, you know, my manager heard a gift in me and she wants to go hard, you know, so we, I want to go hard now too. But I think I always wanted to be a rapper, but nothing else. I can't really think of no other dream. And then when I came out of jail, I wanted to be a trucker and I, I got my CDL. That's awesome, man. <laughs> All right, so let's, get, let's focus on the jail aspect. 10th grade, you're caught up in a shooting. How does that end? Like what happens that night? So um, I caught a robbery case first, right? Um, I got locked up. They let me out because it was my first. I was still going to court, but they let me out because it was like my first one. And in the process of that, I got locked up a couple more times for stupid shit like trespassing, smoking here, stupid shit. And then the when I got locked up for the attempt murder, um, yeah, they took me in. They wanted me to say a story. I, I made up a story actually, and they, you know, they were like, "You think I'm stupid?" And they fucking beat me up for it. Um, the cops beat you up. Yeah, in the, the holding cell. Yes. So that night, you get. Are you arrested on scene when you pull the trigger? Nah. Um, the way I got caught is crazy. It's very personal, honestly. But somebody close to me got um, told on me. That's and, how it always goes down. Yeah, but damn, you. If I tell you how close you, a family member. Mm-hmm. And they they ratted you out. Yeah, they told them exactly where I'll be. Um, and then, you know, people told me, you know, I was, from what I heard, I was able to go to Alabama. <laughs> so my grandfather was black. He would have took me to Alabama and I would have been good out there. But, you know, they told me, yo, just give yourself up. If you get caught, that's seven more years. And I thought I was, hit, you know, I was running for a body at the time. So I'm like, right, fuck it. So I went and smoked mad blunts. And then I went to my crib. And when I got to my crib, the detectives were there already. And they were, that family member was there. And I'm like, what the fuck are you doing here? And, and I went. And then from there, and they was like, yo, what happened? And I'm like, yo, I don't know what you're talking about. And then what happened? They pressed me, whatever. Beat my ass up. My mom's came, brought me a sandwich. I couldn't even eat it. I ain't tell her why, though, but I was hurting inside. Like They beat you up at your own house? No, they beat me up in, in the 40... So second, they brought, some 40 thirds, some they brought like you the station. They just beat the shit out of you. Well, yeah, when they saw that I was lying to them, because they kept saying, what happened? So I made up a story. And You're that's why I went to jail. I could have beat it. I could have beat this shit. Wow. Um, to this day, I probably go, you know, but I made up a story. Well, I can't now. I fucking admitted it. But um, I made up a story thinking they'll let me out. And they it was like, you think I'm stupid? And they beat my ass out. They put the telephone book to my chest and just like kept hitting me through the telephone book, the, the yellow pages. Yeah. And yeah, it did me dirty. My mom's came. I was a minor at that. So when my mom's came, 
She was like, you okay? Because I really, you know, I was hurt. And she brought me a brand new sandwich. She was like, please eat. She's crying. And I'm like, Ma, don't cry, Ma. Don't worry about it. And when she left, I threw, I couldn't even eat the sandwich. I threw the sandwich away. Now at that on time, top of that, I was nervous. You know what I mean? At that time, you thought the guy had died. You didn't know if he survived. I thought he was dead, yeah. But when the when they was interrogating me, they was like, um, he has three bumps in his head. He got three bumps in his head. So that kind of like told me he was alive. So it was like a roller coaster because people telling me, well, before I got locked up is when I was like unsure if he was dead or alive. Because people were like, he's dead? No, he's alive. He's dead. So when I got locked up, locked up, like when they came and got me, I thought he was dead. But then when he, they started interrogating me, they was like, he's he's out the hospital. He only got three bumps on his head. So like that. The streets talk and then everything's yeah. fine now. So do you get released on bond or they just hold nah, you? Nah, I stood. Nah, I was there for, nah. For the rest? Yeah. Oh, that's where, did, I, where did they take you? Rikers Island. Rikers Island. So yeah. what's being on Rikers Island like at 15 Oof. years old? Yo, bro, I went to Rikers Island 2000, the end of 2002. And I was there all the way to the end of 2003. And let me tell you, I did six years. I did. I was in Kaksaki. I don't know if you heard of Kaksaki. Is that at Rikers too? No, or? Kaksaki is a maximum security. Um, Rikers is just the you know you know it's Rikers Island, the New York City, the county. Yeah, that's like it one of the, the most worst notorious. Time of my life. Really. <laughs> so what it, what is Rikers like? Like, can you describe what it's I like? I give you uh, yeah, details. Why man. the reputation is so bad? All right. So Rikers Island, the first day I got there, um. I went to, uh, I was in a reception area. It's like, I was in the sprungs at first. It was like sprung one, which is the reception. I could, it could be sprung three or sprung one, but it was like one of the sprungs reception. You're there for like a week. Then you got the two sprungs that you're there for a while. But if you got a high case like me, you go straight to the building and the building is where it get crazy at. The sprungs is like, it's wild. It's still wild in the sprungs, but it's not as crazy as the building because the building, the inmates run it. I mean the the sprungs the the COs run it, so um, yeah my I already before I even got to the sprungs because they put me there by accident I was supposed to go straight to the building before I even got to the sprungs, um you know I was fighting already you know what I mean and and the holding cell with people that's in the building, um and yeah I remember walking up into the shit and you see all because it was like nighttime the sprungs is like a little walkway and then you got the south side and the north side and there's windows. And you could see like everybody just looking at us, holding all blankets and shit as you're going in. Everybody like, you know how in the, in the movie, they be like, ah, oh, they banging the, that's all it was missing. Cause all, you know, they just looking at us like fool from the window. All you see is the, the, the look like shadows, just mad figures. And you know, like I always had a thing in my life that yeah, I might be scared, but then I, I like click something and that's it. I'm and like, it leaves. How, um, what type of people are they putting you with? Is it older people or just kids? This or? is kids. Just um, kids at Rikers. 16 to 18. But they look 30. <laughs> yeah, kids look old. Because, yeah, I'm big now, but I was little, bro. And I was small. What are these other kids here for? Murder, attempt murder. And that's just um, normal? That's oh, crazy. Oh, it's crazy. They, I, I know somebody that got killed in Rikers Island. I know it's, it's just it's not enough time for the Rikers Island stories, but that was crazy, crazy times. Like, you know, I held my own, though. You see, I ain't got no cuts on me. You know what I mean? Like, nobody could throw dirt on my name. Um, it's just, you know, the inmates running. You got the inmates running the house, and then you got the day room dummy that, which I pretty much was, um, that, you know, you just stay in the day room, but then you got the pop-off dummies. You know what I mean? The pop-off dummies are the, the people that run the house be like, yo, go jump him. I was never that. Like, I was just the dude, don't fuck with me or we gonna fight. You know what I mean? I had my little chair. You know what I mean? I just didn't want to lock out, which is you go, to, you go inside nine, everybody else stay out at night. I didn't want to do that. When I got to my last house, which is Street Main, I started wiggling because I was so little. I used to wiggle out the slots. So, you know, I'd be like, yo, crack my slide, crack my slide. The people, and I'll just wiggle my ass out. Are you scared, like, being on Rikers at this age? Like, what's your thoughts? Um, yeah, like, I, like, all right, so when I was in, when I was going to my first court date, I was still, I went to, I got to Rikers Island, and that same fucking night, like, I probably got there at four in the morning, that same day I had court. So I didn't really even get to chill there. Went to court. And that's when I was there with dudes that was in the building. So I'm not scared yet, right? So I'm there, somebody, it's a long story, but somebody was like telling somebody else, He, I guess this dude was fucking bored. He tells somebody else, yo, this guy got nice clothes on. Cause before I got locked out, I started making my little, getting my clothes and shit. So he's like, yo, this guy got nice clothes on. Why you want to ask him for a size? So the dude was like, yo, what size are you? And I looked at him like, Look at this pussy. You know what I mean, that's my man to this day. He know who I'm talking about. Like, he's out here with me. Um, and then this other dude whispered in my ear, yo, if somebody asks you for your shit, you got to pop. Even if you're not going to give it to them, you got to pop. 
So I'm like, what? He's like, yeah. So I got up, popped on him, and I went to another cell because the COs came, grabbed me up, threw me in another cell. And I laid on my, I laid on the on the bench. I was in my own cell and I just started tearing. Like, and I was like, damn, this is this is it. Like, I'm here for life. Like, I'm gonna have to fight every day. This is what you wanted, this is what you're here. And then I wiped my face and I sat up, took a deep breath, and I ain't never cry again. <laughs> wow. And I just that's why I said I throw my shit away, cause you you gotta adapt. But like what I'm gonna do? Like you're gonna get eaten up alive if you go in there with that type of energy. You had to grow up so fast, immediately. Man. Yeah, immediately. Like when? Do you ever think about like what other kids your age were doing regularly, and you're sitting in here in the, one of the worst prisons in America? Yeah, it's it's, it's whack because um, a lot of the conversations I can't even get into. Like you know, my crew, they never the people I'm, I, I talk to every day. They never been to, you know some of them been to jail, but they never really did too much time like me. And they have their teenager stories. I don't. I want my shit was in there. I ain't got high school, college, none of that. Did you ever finish high school or no? I got my GED in the in prison. Yeah, I got my general. Yeah. Now, how, did you know how much time you were facing at that point? When in Rikers Island, nah. That's why I was so angry, like fighting all the time and shit. But um, once I once I found, cause I thought I was going away forever. Like I had lawyers telling me, just take fifteen for each. You're young. You'll be home by by your thirty five, forty. You know. Firing them. As soon as they told me I could fire my attorney, I fought, I was firing like two of them. And then I got one that she fucking, he got me, um, he got me five years for the 10 murder. And then I had a robbery. I had a one and three for the robbery. So when they put them together, it uh, turned into six years. And yo, that's why I know I could have beat it. <laughs> Cause it, I could have beat this shit. Six years for an at uh, attempted murder, isn't yeah. it? Was that the final charge that you pled out to attempted murder? To the second. Attempted murder to the yeah. second. So it was just a straight six years that they gave you? Five for that, and then the the robbery to the first, which was with a gun. So they uh they con uh they ran it concurrent, now and what, it turned into six. Yeah. What is your mom talking to you about at this it's point? It's sad because, you know, I'm watching my brother get locked up, my father's locked up, my family's getting locked up, and, you know, my mother always cried. So, you know, her baby, I'm her baby. You know what I mean? So me going in there is just, oh man, it was hard for her. Like I didn't see my mother not one time. Like from that day in the in the interrogation room, I had I ain't see her since um until I came home. You didn't want her to come visit? Nah, she did she couldn't. She wasn't a, a citizen. She oh, was always she a wasn't immigrant. A, I didn't even think of that. Yeah. Why so there was no way around her they would have checked. Like if 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 we had if I had my mindset if, if the people around her had the mindset I have now there's always a way you know what I mean but she wasn't like I said she wasn't taught to think outside the box she was just taught with what you tell her. Gotcha. So you get sentenced. The judge gives you the six years that you signed for. Mm -hmm. Where what prison do you end up in? Um, I go to All Star for a month, which is the reception, um, which was my favorite because they had the best food and that shit. <laughs> they had these cookies. Oh man. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> you see what you see what I'm thinking about in jail? Hey, that's how that's like, how yo, we got cookies to. tomorrow. I ain't even worried yeah. about this bit, you know what I mean? So um Dude, we were thinking cheesecakes. What? Uh, yeah, we were you, thinking we, you know you circle with the fucking lunch man, you like, oh, they got having pizza on this Dude, day. You that's, gotta what beat you, it. that's what you look forward to. It's yeah. like high school, it's you know? Chicken you, day, yeah. I remember every new spot I went to, I'd get the commissary list and I'm <laughs> highlighting and I'm excited. Hi, they don't got that yeah. over there. Yeah, yeah, like like a week before, you know, commissary commissary would be a week out, and I'm thinking because that's what I'd look forward to. Yeah, it's like building an Amazon list but yep. on commissary. Yep, exactly. So what prison do you end up for the whole time? So, so Ulster, I was there for a month. I got transferred out to, to Green Correctional Facility. It's an adolescent jail, but they let um, adults in there as well, but it's dominated by the adolescents. Is it Greenville or just Green? It's Green. There is uh, a Greenville in New York, though. Yeah, that I think I could be wrong. I think that's a, a max. I could be wrong. Yeah, because we had a CO on the show that worked yeah. there. Greenville, it sounds familiar. I know Greenhaven is definitely a max. Yeah, Greenhaven too. Maybe that's what it was. That's probably what you're talking about. Yeah. yeah. So you, I was in Green. You yeah. end up in this prison. Are they like opening up to you and open arms, the inmates, because of like um, your, your reputation? What's it like? Well, I, I got up there and I knew a few people um, that knew me. And I mean, they know I was valid. So, um, and up there, you know, it's crazy. Like, you know, I grew up in such a dominated project with, with none but black people. I'm, with, I'm like one of five, six Spanish families in it. Um, and you know, I didn't grow up with the segregation shit. I never looked at it like that. I didn't even look at myself, you know, the way I look at myself today. Um, up there, you know, they, you know, as soon as you go in there, they know you're Spanish. The Spanish people try to pull you into their little corner. 
Yeah, how does I mean, that so, work with like the gangs and being Spanish in prison? Because yeah, I think you're our first like Spanish person on the show. They they all rock like the Spanish is a gang itself, you know. Like they all rock with each other. Like you know, you go into a house, the Spanish people they gonna come up to you with a bag with soap, slippers. I'm not saying all the um, nationalities do this. I, I'm just telling you from what I experienced. I mean, they throw you the the soap, slippers, toothpaste, tell you who not to fuck with in the house. Like, ah, right, you here, you knew that dude right there, Rabo, that dude right there. You know what I mean? And, you know, it's um, you outside, you got your Latin Kings over there, you got your Trinitarios, which is the Dominican gang, you got uh, the Mexicans, like, you see how they, Mexicans go, go to war here in jail, they all won, you know, so in jail, all the Spanish people are won. Now, something I've seen in prison is that the Spanish groups, gangs, whatever you want to call it, are the biggest hustlers. Oh, yeah. What did, what were you seeing them do to hustle in prison? I did, I did my little thing, like, um... My sister's, uh, my sister, uh, my mom's rest in peace, they could tell you I used to send money home. <laughs> I mean, like, I made my little moves in there. Yeah, I'd meet Spanish guys that would that are, were immigrants that had to do their um, stay in federal prison before going yeah. to ICE. They'd rather be there making money and sending it back. Yeah, that's what they're here for from the jump. Like, they left their country just to send money back. So, so how are they making this much money in prison? So in jail, um, you know, like, let's say a joint, you know, it was a blunt and a joint, right? So... A blunt is a hundred dollars. You could sell that for a hundred dollars. You could buy a blunt for five dollars out here. It could be the trashiest weed. If it's that amount, it go by the amount. You gotta give me a hundred dollars. A joint, you could sell that shit for like seven dollars. I mean, so you got people in there that they they're addicted. There's people that sniffing dope. I was selling a little bit, a little bit of that too. Like they're sniffing dope and they're addicted. You don't get money every day, cause you know. So what they do, they 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 rack it up. Like they get a credit line, and then by the end of the month, you guys, your family got to send that to my family. So how yeah, how does currency work? Is is it all on credit, and they send it on you know Western mm-hmm. Union? They'll call their family, be like, yo, send this amount to this this address, and you know what I mean that's how it's done. You never get it sent to the prison because that's how that's how I went to the box one. So there's no physical currency in the prison. There's no like well, macros. You could, or... Yeah, you could sell. You know, like if it's a little buy, like. Like a seven dollar joint, you know, they pay with food. You know what I mean? I got this. All right, let me get that, 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 that. All right, good looking. You swap it out. But if it's a lot, you know, you can only spend fifty five to one hundred dollars. You know, you, you owe me seven hundred. <laughs> like, what happens? Have if, your family send that. <laughs> what happens if someone doesn't pay? What goes down when you're in a a gang like this? I never, I never had somebody not pay because I kind of like know who to deal with to this day. But um. You know, they get you out of there, you know, because as, as easy as it was to give you the drugs, you know, you could pay somebody else that really wanted to, to take care of that for you. Now, are mm-hmm. they resorting to violence or are they just send them to the shoe, to the hole? It's always resorting to violence in jail. So it's they're no, just going to attack them and... Yeah, they're going to get you out of there. It's never, oh, he dead to me? I, I ain't fucking with him no more. No, because if you do that, them 30 dudes over there, they're going to they gonna take advantage of you. So you got to make an example. It's no making one example, like... If you got to keep making the example, you got to keep making the example. Sometimes you're lucky. You just make one example and you don't have to do it again. But, you know, like some people, they got to keep making it. Now, what was the food situation like with the Spanish groups in prison? Like, what are they cooking with the commissary? Because I would see some oh, pretty man. fascinating they, things. Yo, we was jealous because I went to Washington, too, but that's late in my bed. They got the stoves and shit. So we always used to talk shit about them. Because we had the mics, but you would be, so, yo, the mics, they make a whole fucking course meal. Like, Thanksgiving was amazing. Like, I'm this kid, and they, you know, they come with a bowl, and you got, I don't know how the fuck they did it, but you have uh, beef stew, you have pollo guisado, I think that's chicken stew in English, which is like the, the soup and the tomato sauce and shit, like, and rice with corn, and, yo, it was just crazy. Like, it was good. It was good. And they're making yeah. this all off the commissary. Well, now nah, you get packages to a, um, the commissary. You could get the simple shit like the cans and stuff. But commissary, you get the exotic stuff like the fruit. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean? The the cakes that you don't get out here, the seasoning that you might need. So the did, packages were important. Did you know how to make food in prison? Like, Yeah, hell yeah. What, I, what was your go-to? My go-to, um, it was it got to the point that my boy, when I went to Kaksaki, um, they started asking me to cook because I was so dope at it. Like, hey, send it over, man. I ain't even have to buy food. And I make like um, my shit was uh, damn uh, beef log. You chop up the beef log, fry it up with like some. This is my little secret, but 
You fried up with with the the pickle juice. Oh man, yo, just just trust me. Yeah, you can't sleep on the pickle juice, what? man. Yo, yeah. you'll be surprised what pickle juice could do. Pause. Pickle juice and the fish oil. And and shit. Yeah, and the fish, the mackerel fish oil, you can use yeah. that to fry up. Yeah, make a lot of things happen with that. Yeah. Thanks. Well, were you ever addicted to drugs at all or anything like that? Nah, nah. Um, weed. I would say I was addicted to weed. I was smoking mad weed in jail. Um, but nah, I never had no other crazy habits. So what like inspired you to start selling heroin in prison then? the opportunity like um my man came up to me like yo you mad cool with that old motherfucker right there he do this and i'm like yeah he like well i get it so i'm like how much you giving it to me for you giving me for that and then i holler at my boy like yo you looking for that right yeah well i could get it for this and then he'd be like, i'll give you this amount and that's how it happened so i started again my boy would get smashed and i would give it to um I, I, he was my first cussy and then you know he knew the other you know people that fucked with it and I used to protect my my shit too. Like it was times they'd be doped up, like nodding, and you know the police see that they send you to take a drug test. If you got it, you go away. So one time I saw one of them dozing off and shit. I'm trying to figure out how to make him look normal, and I grabbed a fucking um a, a towel. I wet it with cold water and I splashed it on his head. And he fucking woke up like wow. he was in the desert. Yeah, and I was like, yo, you got to stop nodding. I was thinking of my money. Like you leave, this money stops. Wow. Wake the fuck up. <laughs> and how much money were you making, like, on a weekly basis? Yeah, like, I would say a weekly basis, probably, like, because, you know, it's one, I had, like, one or two, three customers, so they're not going crazy with it at the end of the day. The month, probably, and this was very short-lived, like, a two-month period. Um, A week, I probably was making, like, 400 Which 500. is good money for Hell yeah, because I was prison. sending it home. I was sending it to my mom, like... Take, keeping some to, for me in the, in the commissary. My shit was, my commissary was crazy. And then, you know, I was sending, I was buying my niece her crib, her bed, her, her, her dresser and shit. Yeah, and did you have a prison job too or? Yeah, um, always, always thinking. I, I got uh, lawns and grounds, which is uh, mowing the lawn, picking up the garbage because I knew I'll have access to the whole prison. And um, whatever you don't get into the package room, like whatever they, they say, now nah, you're not allowed to have this, they throw it away, but all they do is slice it once. They give it one slice. So they'll, it'll be like, let's say, a pack of chicken, right? And they'll give it one slice and throw it away. But that bag just got there like two hours ago, and me picking up the garbage, I could open the bag and be like, it's just coming right to my crib. And, I, that, you know, it was like a little scheme. And then you could get around, you know, like you could sell your shit over there because you're mowing, yo. I left it right here, you know what I mean? Like, and how much do you get paid for this lawns job? Seven cents an hour. Seven cents an hour. But you're making money as a hustle selling the stuff you find. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, I was, yeah, exactly. A lot of the shit I was bringing back, I was flipping. Those I usually just um swap out. You know what's fascinating is that the federal prisons and like the state prisons kind of operate the same ways and like prisoners like don't talk to each other at like home yeah. angle, but they all operate the same way. Yeah. Like similar stuff happens. Mm -hmm. um, big thing in federal prison was the Spanish guys making the hooch or the liquor. Yeah, yeah, Does that sure. happen? And yeah, you got the hooch, definitely. How are they making it? Can you break that I, down? I, I never really made it, but I think they use like orange peels or some shit. They like leave it, uh, damn, I, I knew once it's like it has to do with fruits and you leave it like sitting for a long ass time and then it, it creates like you know the chemical like you get drunk off of it and then once you bust that shit out the butt the bag open you can smell it heavy and it smells like liquor yeah you Did ever you, tasted it uh no i thought I, it was disgusting I, with the I, mold exa i took them i took a sip and i was like i can't do this shit. Yeah, i'm not they, a drinker they're putting like bread in it they're putting yeah fruit. the bread yeah, yeah you got the bread in it and it sits in the walls yeah where are they yeah, hiding exactly. it over there toilet sometimes like yeah, yeah. i know dude That's it's, it's you, man. insane man it's literally <laughs> insane Facts. that is so <laughs> wild yeah. and um what what's like the most violent thing you saw in prison well, um, violence, you know, I've seen people stabbed up all the time, but um, I would say I saw somebody hanging. Hanging? Yeah, like this was in Rikers Island, though. You walked by and they were just hanging? Next door neighbor. Wow. He was hanging. Someone put him that there or he did up. it himself? He did it himself. And yeah. it, what do you even- A little, um, he was some African dude. He only got caught with four pounds of marijuana. And, and what do you well, say? Well, at that time, four yeah. pounds was crazy. What happened? What, what, what do you think in that moment when you see something like that? <sighs> You that just, never goes away, right? You, nah, mm -hmm. I still see it. Like, talking about it right now. But you go to the day room and you just, you know, first they lock the whole shit down for, like, the whole day. Know what I mean? Um, talk to your man. Like, yo, what? And you just talk about it. It was crazy, man. Like, you know, people like me, they don't um, understand suicide. Like, we look at that, like, you know, easy way out. So, you know, go to the day room, talk about it. Like, damn, how, how, how could he do that? What about his family, you know? Yeah. Just move on. That's it. And... 
that's just that's just crazy. I, I, yeah, I, I bro. couldn't even He imagine. was only like 16, 17. He had to be. He was so skinny. I remember one of the dudes punched him in the chest so hard that he couldn't breathe for like two minutes. And I'm just looking at him like, damn. You know? What about sex offenders, rats? Are they allowed to walk your yard in, in, in that prison? Um, they, they walk the yard, but, you know, a lot of the COs, you know, like if you're in one of them houses, the CO will be like, oh, dude right there, you know, he's, he's this. Like, you know, you got the rapos. They don't respect the rapos, but a lot of the rapos, like, there was one that was there like 30 years. So they, you know, pretty, they, they look at it like he got fucked up his entire bed. But the new ones, they love the new ones. So they'll, they'll let you know, like, yeah, I'm going to go get coffee. Um, I'll be back in like, you know, two minutes. And, you know, they won't really tell you, but they'll tell you. And you go take care of it. I wasn't one of those, but I've seen it done many times, you know. What does that mean? I'm gonna go take off. Beat his ass up, like that's a kind word. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm gonna go. This guy, you know, he like touching kids. Did we'll go drink coffee for two minutes. And wow. what kids? <laughs> you know, I done stomped a few, but I wasn't the go-to. Like you know, like yo, come here, this kid. I wasn't that guy. I was the guy, like yo, I'm about to do this nigga dirty. The, the PO said this, and I, I go, you know, help but him out. You but. couldn't say no. You had to do it. Nah, nah. I don't know. I never asked. had to do nothing. I don't know. So if they asked you, oh, or the CO, if anyone asked, nah, nah, you, it's no. a choice. They, okay. but they know the fucking MAs are so crazy. Uh, a freebie, that's a freebie. You want to let your steam off? It's free. You're not gonna get in trouble. Like when they come around hands and you do this shit when they, and you know you ain't going away. They just oh, gonna oh, take they're him. Checking your hands. Yeah, they just gonna take him. Yeah. It was him, and they get him the fuck out of because they don't want to be in the room with them. What know? what kind of corruption do you see from prison guards, men or a woman? Um. I would say the drugs. I didn't really see too much corruption, but uh, yeah, we probably um, some illegal uh, food. But nah, I never really seen. That's like the corruption with that thing goes on in the maxi maxes and shit where people live. They live there forever. I was in a max where some people lived forever, but they'll make it down there, you know, because they've been doing good for like 10 years and shit. Now, did you lose, like, any good time or anything because of the shit you were getting yeah, into? I lost all my good time at one time, and then I got it back. So how much time do you end up having to do? If I didn't get my good time back, I would have had to do uh, six years flat. And with the good time, I did five years, seven months, something like that. Because you were so young, was the whole time you were in prison just, like, you know, violence, gangbanging, doing whatever, and, like, not, you weren't in a clear direction, like, I need to get my shit together? I'm not gonna lie, I met a lot of OGs that, you know, they, they you know, I met some OGs that would look at me and be like, how old are you? And be like, 18. You got another one in you? Uh, meaning another bed. Yeah, I'm that- young enough to go home and come back to jail, and that shit, I hate shit like that. I don't like people downplaying like, don't, don't think you know me. Like, you think I'm going to go out there and come back here to you? So shit like that would be like that. And, you know, the people I was running with doing funny shit, it made me be like, I get the fuck out of here. But at the time, you probably thought it was cool well, that they were saying nah, that. I would do, nah, because I had the OGs telling me, yo, you, 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 you suck. Like, I never met, you know, not to talk about myself, but they like, you know, I don't really meet young niggas like you, so I like who you are. Like, go out there and become somebody. So there were people that were saying that then? Yeah, definitely. Okay. So it wasn't always negative, like, you got another bit in you and this It and wasn't that. always. It was, most of it was, but then you got those that you could see the fire in their eyes that you know they about it, and they're telling you that. The people that's like, you got another one in you, they're the, they're the losers. They're, just because you in jail don't mean you tough and gangster. There's a lot of losers in jail. Now the you know t- that. Yeah, the time you were in prison, did you spend any time thinking, like, what's next for you? What's your future? Your actions that got you there? Man, I was, you know, being that I didn't experience too much at all, you know, I didn't really fuck, you know. Um, <laughs> I got head like, twice. Like, so you wedded a virgin. Yeah, pretty much, you know what I mean? So, so I had that's to learn what you were thinking to, about. Yeah, pause. I had to learn how to do my thing in there, like, jerk my dick. I had to learn. I never jerked my dick as a kid. Really? <laughs> I have to talk about that, but yeah, like... I had to learn. I had to think of the time I fucked Shorty. Like I was like, I remember how it felt, and I, like that's crazy, bro. That's like I no, had no experience. That's what gets people through. I used to think about it all mm-hmm. the time, Pat. I talked about it on other episodes. Yeah. I used to you you think because you have to go off a of memory. You yeah. think about past relationships, all of that. See, but me, I used to create things in my head, like because you had never experienced. Yeah, it. so I would create a, a girl. Like I would put, I, I would like live a, a movie in my head sometimes, especially when I was doing my box time. Like I would like create. I think that's why I'm so creative because I used to really live in my head. I never was in jail. I was always in my head. And you know, guys in prison give the best dating advice because they be, they have so much experience. Yeah, I was writing poems, <laughs> doing little cards, like 
making little doors. You open there's a little picture of us. Like, <laughs> uh, did you ask guys in prison like about sex tips or, or um, girls nah, or anything like that? Nah, because I knew about I knew everything that had to be done. I yeah. just didn't get a chance to do it. <laughs> well, I've done it, but I didn't like you know do it multiple times. I got there and then. I was still on my little crazy shit. You were young. You were yeah, young. Yeah. Was it everything but, that you imagined it to be when it finally happened? Yeah, the heavy breathing. <laughs> <laughs> Coming in like two minutes. Like, yeah, all that, everything. Oh, but, wow. yo, before I got locked up, I was having parties with all the girls, like most of the girls in my school. Like, So I knew I had potential like to get girls, but um, I just, you know, I got locked up immediately. So <laughs> when I found out, I was like, yo, I could get business. I got locked up. <laughs> you definitely weren't shy, right? Um, you were kind of out there. I, I'm shy when you when you get you know if you you got to get to know me like I was yeah I was never really that's why I rap so late because I always been nice. I, the, if you know me, you know I rap. I always been nice. I just never was confident to be like yo ah like you know I was just keeping it to myself. Yeah. yeah. So, so you get out. What year do you get out? And how old are you? Uh, 2008, 22. And what's life like? What was the hardest thing to adjust to? What are you doing? Should I go to my parole? in Manhattan and she's like I heard you're a blood I'm like what I'm a blood who the fuck told you this and she's like yes you are says it here I'm like I'm not and she's like you can't wear red um if you wear red I'm gonna violate you so I'm like all right I won't wear red and she's like and you can't go to the Bronx says it here like it was a judge saying I was like banned from the Bronx and I'm like my whole family is in the Bronx and she's like well you you're um paroling to Manhattan they got to come to you and um I went straight to the Bronx like right after that meeting <laughs> I went straight on the full train. Yeah. Took that shit to the Bronx. My family had a little party for me. I couldn't even eat. Like, I couldn't eat. It was so much good food in front of me. I couldn't even eat. You know, it was Did weird. your body take a little bit to adjust to outside free world food when you got back after eating yeah, commissary? Yeah, I couldn't really eat heavy at all because my body, I was so lean and cut up and, you know, I was I was mad sexy. <laughs> I mean, when I got out, I I'm was sure a sexy girl, motherfucker. the girls loved you, oh, man. I inspired, like, there's people to this day that work out because of, um, like, there's family that came to my crib and I, um, I came out the shower with my towel and they're like, what the fuck? <laughs> and they work out now because of that, you know what I mean? So... Yeah, I was I was um good money, but the food, yeah, I was going to all these places to eat and I was taking like two bites, three fries. It took a while, yeah. It what, took was, a while. what was like a hard adjustment to adjust to, either mentally or physically? Um, crossing the street, uh, traveling on the train, um, interacting with people. Cause, you know, like I didn't really want to bother nobody. Like, you know, I was it was so much stupid shit that would happen to me when I came home. Like I was walking up the avenue one time in Harlem. And I'm waiting for the bus to go uptown. And I'm like, yo, this bus is not. So I'm just walking to each bus stop. Like, I'll just walk to the next one while I wait. And finally, I'm like, yo, what the fuck? So I asked somebody, yo, where's the bus for the uptown? It's not coming. And he looked at me sad. And he was like, all the cars are going downtown. And he was like, you got to go to the other avenue. I didn't even register that there was no bus, no cars going uptown. I'm waiting for an uptown bus on the downtown, on the downtown side of Harlem. Like, no. stupid shit. Waiting for doors to open. And they're not opening. You shaking them, and then you look to the right, and that's the entrance. Like shit, like that. Like I just, I was so used to being directed. I had to find my way. You know. Wow. Yeah, I had, to, I had to find my direction. And how's your relationship with like your mom and your siblings at that point? Um. You know, honestly, it was a little bumpy because I came home and I saw that a lot of my family had like, you know, there was this Facebook was happening, YouTube and shit. I'm not YouTube. Um. MySpace. Yeah, it was just And I started. saw that a lot of my family had pages for other people in jail. And I'm like, damn, like, what the, what the fuck happened to me? Like, I'm just nobody? You know what I mean? So it was it was bumpy because I saw the favoritism. Um, but I never hold grudges on nobody till this day. Like, you a dickhead, you a dickhead. That shit ain't got nothing to do with me. Right? If you treat me like shit, I'm just not going to be around you. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's what do you think you missed out on the most? those years because you missed your prime teenage years mm -hmm. to prison you missed your 21st birthday to prison 18 yeah, the, some of the that. big the big milestones yeah facts um i think i, I missed um the opportunity to maybe i would have changed you know maybe i would have fucking went to college i probably would have you know because i went to jail and started listening to these dudes telling me to do the right thing what if i met somebody that would have told me to do the right thing at that moment instead of somebody saying oh you wildin i come let's do it like this instead you using handguns let's use these you robbing chinese food people let's rob this drug spot neighborhood you know like 
if I had a positive person, I would have been somebody better. So uh, that's my regret. I never met somebody that. Could be that mentor. Yeah, you. and that's why I, I treat everybody so good. Like I was always man nice to, like for example, the uh, the little kids on my block, man, like uh, shout out to Ito, he's like my little cousin. Um, you know, he had a hard life growing up. I saw that, so I, I wanted to be a good person to him. So I became like a big brother to him. Uh, shout out to Lil Shelby. He has his brothers, but every time I saw him, I gave him mad extra love. Uh, Lil uh, dude from High Bridge, the label. Um, his name is QP now, Quincy. Like he was one of the little dudes in the block running around. And I used to show him mad love when I seen him because I never got that. So I, I wanted to give that. So this day, yeah. I mean, I want to give people sneakers off my feet. Yeah. You when, when you got out, did you want to get back into crime and doing what you were doing? Uh, at first, um, nah, I was, I was legit. I was, I, 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 I went to, I got jobs in stores with mad females, <laughs> and you know, I was op- occupied doing that. And um, unfortunately, you know, because you know, it was my situation. But um, yeah, it, I started doing all that other shit, I, I, a little crime, like selling my things and stuff. I have to. Afterwards, you know, like I didn't jump right into it. But you never went back to prison. Never went back to prison. I'm never going back. So hopefully. you think that was the eye opener you needed to to get on the right track? Yeah, because I I saw that my problem is violent. I'm so violent. Like I just react well, reacted so quick back then. I always wanted to do the bad shit. So now I I don't I don't want to do that. I'd rather just fucking fight my pride and scream on my pillow at night. <laughs> yeah, how do you channel that anger now to make sure that never happens again? Because it never it's really hard. goes away. Yeah, it's hard. Like you know the shit that happens today. Like you know you want to fucking go crazy, but you can't because you know the now I have something to live for. Like before I didn't. So how I channel it? I rap about it. I go write a fucking rap about it, or uh, I go eat, um, smoke a blunt. I smoke a lot. Um, chill with my kids, you know, chill with somebody very close to me, go get into something with my manager, like, just, you know, I can't fucking, I can't let the devil win, and he's knocking, like, I got so much shit happening, even today, I'm on my way to to talk about bettering myself from what I've been through, thanks to you, right, and look at what almost happened, I shit could have went so left, but to the kids out there, like, you gotta think, you know, like, don't just jump out, because you don't know where you're jumping out to, you don't know there's 30 people up the block or 40 cops or, you know, like, just don't jump out. Don't let your anger lead the way. Like, channel that shit. Hold it. You know what else is important to think about is that you, when you shot someone, he could have died, but yeah. he didn't die. And that mm-hmm. gave you automatically another second chance at life to turn it around. And I think yeah. if you, sometimes you think about that, that makes you think too. Because I think about my actions and mm-hmm. where, like, it could have went worse, you know, yeah. situations. And I survived that and I made it through and it didn't happen a certain way because of one little instinct or action or whatever. And you got to live with that and you have yeah, to- you, you got to live with that. You have to live with that and you have to, you have to remember that and, and use that to, mm-hmm. to never go back to that. Yeah. And when did you end up having kids? How far after when you got out? As soon as I got home. I had uh, a kid you got the next the, year. Really? <laughs> I think, came out 08, I got a kid 09. Do you think that was too soon for you for like your development? I didn't, you know, I was I was just a fucking horny kid. I didn't know she could get pregnant. I, I was you told know she could condoms, right? Yeah, it was shit. <laughs> oh, <laughs> man. Fucking condom. Yeah. <laughs> or, well, yeah, man, I got a beautiful daughter, man. Just My one baby. kid? Just I got three daughters. Three, same three daughters? Wow. Same, 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 uh, same mother, though. Same mother. Yeah. Are you guys still together? Nah, we, we're uh, in troubled times right now. But we, we, we co-parent to the max, though. Like, yeah. one thing I could uh, appreciate, like, you know, we put our kids first over anything. You know yeah, what do mean? it for the kids. Yeah, definitely. What um what inspired you to get into the career you're at now? Did you work a normal job ever, or did you go right yeah, into um, music? I was, uh, you know, I did stock boy shit. I always wanted better, so I did a stock boy shit that was paying me, like, $9 an hour. What's I, stock boy? Uh, Charlotte rules all the clothes. You know, I'm the one that brings the boxes in and put them where they gotta be. Yo, just go there, all that dumb shit. Okay. You know? Um, but I was so dope at my job. Like I quit it once and they hired me back. They begged me to come back because the stock room looked beautiful. You know. Yeah. And without me, all the girls running it, that shit looked crazy. You wouldn't find none. But with me, I had everything sectioned off. Um, then I went to selling produce for like Baldor and shit. Then that's when I spoke to the dude about the trucking to trigger the, the thought. Then I worked for Sony. Like I, I kept climbing, you know, I always wanted more. And then from Sony, 
uh, I, I met, I ran into my boy and he was in the truck and he was like, yo, you could do this. And he put me as a helper for four months mm -hmm. and I got my CDL in like two months. And you were able to build a, a life for you with that. Yeah. With the CDL, it, I was, yeah, I was making the most money I ever did. And have there been challenges with a criminal record, an attempted murder charge on your record? <laughs> there was people, um, that didn't give me the job because of my background, but and what do you say in that moment? Do you get mad? They don't you know? tell you. They just yeah. be like, we'll, get, we'll call you. But you know. Yeah, I knew one that one time that I was telling you. Like, How does that make you they, feel? Because I knew somebody in there. It makes me feel like, damn, like, you know, don't judge me for what I did. Like, if you want me to change, see if, you know, give me the opportunity. Like, these jobs that be like, you need to work. You, you got to have a year experience. How the fuck am I going to get the experience if you don't give me the job? And this like, happened 22 years ago, too. Like, yeah. you, you're past. Yeah, this is I think a while it, ago. it poses a question how, when can a person redeem himself? When can they yeah. be given that second opportunity? I, I feel like I'm a great um, example. Like, we can change, you know? Like, yeah, I got my anger. I'm not going to say I'm not angry, but, um, and I don't do my little shit, but, you know, I'm a good dude. I, I done been through hell and back, and I'm still able to fucking love and, and feel, you know, like I, I'm borderline empath, you know what I mean? So, you know, it, we're not all bad in there. Some of us just didn't have no other choice. So you were able to create a music career while you're uh, building this life with your kids, raising your kids, CDL. Uh -huh. how, how does that come into this? That came in. Um, I met some people that, you know, uh, fraud people that was supposed to be in the music business, but I'm appreciative of them because they brought me into offices that I've never been in. And while I was in there, instead of just, you know, Riding the wave, I was picking up things, and because of that, you know, I got with my manager, um, and learned so much. So once she heard me rap, because I was already doing my shit, but the people I was doing it with, kind of like funny, they weren't really using me for what I bring to the table. They was using me for what I had, and um, but they young. I don't really knock them, but I had to get away from that. And now it's like, yeah, it's making sense. I'm I'm doing this rap shit, making money off of it. It's, it's, I have a great response and you know I'm just I'm blowing up little by little and I'm talking about everything we talk about here I'm not always talking about jail because it's way more than jail to my life yeah what's I your mean? message behind your rapping like what is it uh that you know like to the kid that the kid that don't know where to go in life I see you you know um there's another way like this you know if you on your block all day Turn the corner, go around the corner, look past your buildings. There's there's other shit going on. Like my message is, uh, yeah, we from the hub, but like you know, what are you really? You know, what do you want to be in life? Where are you from? Why why why? Where are you now? You know, like it's everything. My message is just positive. It's it's uh resiliency. You know, like everything. You know, like you you got to hear it to understand what I'm saying. Like I'm all over the place, but my message is uh just. Like, you hear the gangster shit in it, but I ain't talking about putting you in a spliff no more. I'm talking about what happens if you get put in a spliff to the people around you. I mean, like... How will you ensure that your daughters, your children don't go down the same path you did? Like we said, man, is where you grow up at. You know, like, if you're growing up in the projects, you're going to know the projects. But if you go to this nice little neighborhood over here, this little town, this townhouse in this beautiful area where the schools are great, that, you know... There's things to always worry about, but for the most part, it's good. You know, it's like in the hood, you got a very slim chance of leaving. Where we at now, she has a very beautiful chance. And it, it comes a lot with her mom. Her mom is a great woman. She has a great job. She's very heavy with the school. I mean, a lot of my kids, they, they like the music, so they see me doing that. They got everything they want in their life, so I know they're going to be good. They Do you might. ever see yourself having a sit-down conversation with them to talk about your past with them so they can learn from it? Um... If it comes to that, yeah. If it comes to that, yeah. But you know, it's crazy how I stereotype it. But they, they girls, so they're not really. They don't really go through all the things the boys go through. We really go through it. The girls, they could get manipulated by the boys most of the time, and that's what I'm teaching them. Like that's why I take them everywhere. I buy them flowers. I, I treat them like you know beautiful little princesses, so they could want that in return. So they know how to be treated. Because exactly. you, you've seen the evil that a man could be. Oh my God! It's and you want to make sure that they don't get that. It's exactly, bro. And, yeah. you know, people don't understand that the things that we hear and see in there, it stays with us forever. You you, you know what's out there. And it affects women forever when they have that one bad, uh -huh. you know, tra traumatic experience or whatever. It, it fucks men those girls up. Men yeah. Some, yeah, men abuse you, a lot of them. You know, women too, though. You know, but I'm just speaking yeah. for my part. Yeah, a man could definitely manipulate. Yeah, they need you know. to know that there's better 
there's better out there. There's better people out mm-hmm. there. And it works both ways. You know, exactly. g- girls that, you know, abuse men and vice versa because it mm-hmm. happens in both. Mental abuse is real, man. It's worse than it, physical. It really is. Mm-hmm. Now, if you could go back in time to your 14-year-old self and sit down with your 14-year-old self, knowing everything you know now, the night before the shooting happened, what do you say to him? I would tell him, don't do not do it because it's not for you. It's for him. Like, he just know you're going to do it. So he asked you to come with him. Yo, you bored? Yo, you going to go rolling? All right. So don't do it, you know? Don't do any of that. Stay in school. Go focus on the girls. Have Go to them parties you're throwing, you know? Like, do the right thing. Like, just look for it. Like, open your mind more. I was so closed-minded. It's ridiculous. I didn't see anything. So I would tell him to open his mind. On on that note, what do you see now? Like, what's in the future for you? What's I your see vision? that. I see that. You know, when I got locked up, I thought New York City was the entire New York. And then you look at the map and you see we're a little dot. So that's basically self-explanatory. There's a lot out there. So I see Cali now. I see uh, dope Florida. I see overseas. Like I, I know there's places out there that I need to get to. It's just not what I'm gonna eat today. What I'm gonna do tomorrow. What you know, it's none of that. It's expansion, growth. There's so much opportunity too in this much, world. Too much, too much. You don't have to do crime. You don't have to do any of that. I didn't have to yeah. do that for money. Yeah, there's yeah. other ways. The money is just the easiest way, the, yeah. the crime. You Look know, at but. the most successful people that got there. They didn't get there through crime. They got mm-hmm. there from working hard and figuring something out. And, and exactly. anyone can do that. Exactly. But Melvin, thank you for coming on the show today. It's been thank a great you. conversation. Uh, we wish you the best. Where could people find you at? Uh, you can find me on all platforms at Alpha Mel 174. That's Alpha M E L 174. I got the lottery single out right now, man. It's talking all that positive shit. You know, if you're having a bad day, you put that on. Um, the album coming out soon. It's called uh, Gotta Be. A lot of positive in there, you know, for your peoples. You know, you probably put in the intro. Like, I got some good, good uh, vibes going on. You can find me everywhere. Alpha Mel 174. Awesome, man. Thank all you, right. man. Have a safe trip you. back. Appreciate it.